Thank you very much, Chief Little Child. I'd like to remind you and, and you virtual uh, observers of the, the location at which the webcast can be seen. It's at tinyurl.com slash linking hands. Uh, I'd also like to inform you that because we're running a little bit late, and because the content of the proceedings today are so important, we will not be taking a break which means that if anyone wants more coffee or has other reasons to, to take a break, please just go out one of the doors at the back and come back in quietly, and uh, uh, that's the way it often is done here in the academic world. So we will not be taking a break after the next speaker. Now I would like to introduce the next speaker. Professor John Malloy, a professor of Canadian studies and of history at Trent University is uh, I think it is fair to say Canada's leading academic expert on residential schools. He was the director of research, uh, or, or rather the lead researcher uh, on residential schools for Canada's Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, and more recently has been uh, named the director of research, historical records, and report preparation for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He's the author of the book, A National Crime, The Canadian Government and the Residential School System, 1879 to 1986. In 2005, the Literary Review of Canada selected that book as one of the 100 most important books in Canadian history. Professor Malloy. Thank you, David, for, uh, for that, uh, that introduction. I'd like to start, of course, by thanking our elders today for uh, wel welcoming us to, uh, to this, this territory. And the organizers, of course, for asking me to come along today. It's a bit humbling when I look down the list of speakers to, uh, to find my name. Speaking after Chief uh, Littlechild, I can't remember who it was, W.C. Field or something, who talked about don't act with dogs or something or other. And I feel that's what I'm following, right? A star act. So I'm, uh, I'm bound to come up short. Uh, I certainly want to thank him for his remarks, uh, his kindness towards me uh, over the last number of years, and even, even his re reference to me this morning is, is uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by, uh, by that. I want to speak um, this morning, or to direct my remarks this morning, particularly to uh, those in the room who, like me, are non-Aboriginals, and those in the room who are, like me, a student. I am unfortunately institutionalized. I, I will never leave the university. While many graduate and go on to real lives, this what I, is what I have been left with. I want to talk to you specifically because even though the, and I don't know the proper term, motto or logo of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission adds, and for the child who came after, even though that really talks about intergenerational impact, I would suggest that it includes all of us people. All of us younger, well I'm not all that young, all of you younger people who indeed have come after the system, who indeed have to uh, consider the impact of that system on a large number of our fellow citizens and who indeed have a responsibility as you are living out this morning by being here to join in much needed reconciliation. So to you I want to direct my remarks and I, I want to begin them by talking about my own education and how I got into this room because all of you have a story about why you're in this room and not somewhere else. I grew up uh, in part in southern Alberta I went to a small grammar school, uh, I left before I got to high school, and down the road from me was a residential school. 
I didn't know there was a residential school there. That was in the 1950s I was there. I didn't know that there was a residential school there until 1992. Like most Canadians, I knew nothing about residential schools. I knew nothing about First Nations people or their existence. They lived in a different country. They lived different lives. And not very many people were interested in them. When I got to graduate school at Carleton University, I was in a history department. I chose to do a quote unquote Indian topic. The number of times I was met in the hallway by, fa by faculty members who said, shouldn't you be in the anthropology department? Because the fact was, Indians were yesterday. Indians made it into the first chapter of a book on Canadian history, you know, the good old fur trade stuff, taking Champlain and making sure he didn't get lost in the wilderness and stuff like that. That was it. They disappeared. They were in the backwater. And that was, in fact, pretty much where they were. Certainly that's where they were in Canadian historiography. And in normal times in Canadian history, that's where they were. Nobody paid any attention. Nobody paid any attention to their communities, their aspirations, etc. There were times, however, critical times in Canada's development, and we are living in one of them, when First Nations affairs have moved to the center of political life, and thus has been directed from the center, as now out of the Prime Minister's office. If you review these times, there was always a common factor, Canadian state development. And while there is always the gloss of selfless, selfless rhetoric, the catchphrase now seems to be improving the relationship, the substance is to quote uh, the famous line from the Clinton campaign, it's the economy, stupid. Or, as it was not in Iraq about democracy but about oil, so too is it at this moment in Canada about tar stands and pipelines and the interests of those who have, pushing aside the rights and interests of those who have little. What has given relevance to Indian affairs is always resource access, and resource cupidity has always been a boost to Canadian colonialism. I know you're all shocked to discover someone who believes that we have a history of colonialism, as we've been ensured by the Prime Minister that we don't, but there it is. And there's evidence of it in current federal policies. Bill C-45, cutting off support from Aboriginal organizations, the failure to consult, on and on and on over the last year, two years. But I must, of course, I guess, fulfill my mandate this morning by talking about the past, and within that context, residential schools. So let me turn to recent research about the schools in one of those first periods of centrality, the first three decades of Confederation, when for most of that time, Sir John A. Macdonald was not only Prime Minister, but head of the Department of the Interior, encompassing control of Indian Affairs, the Northwest Bound of Police, and settlement policies. Here in that period of national consolidation, Canada as empire as it was, integrating British Columbia, Manitoba, and the Northwest Territories, what would be Saskatchewan and Alberta, the economic motivation was not oil though coal figured largely into Canadian desires, but farmland and transportation, especially for the Canadian Pacific Railroad. This challenge was met with an integrated set of policies for First Nations. Treaties, the Indian Act, the past system, banning traditional practices, and most of, of most interest to us here this morning, the creation of residential school policy. These policies were designed quite consciously to achieve the pacification and marginalization of the region's First Nations so that they would be, to quote N.F. Daffin and Nicholas Flood Daffin, the fellow who wrote the pro-residential school report for MacDonald in 1879, these people would be prepared to meet the necessities of the not too distant future, to welcome and facilitate the settlement of the country and to restore its government and to render its government, excuse me, easy and not expensive. Not a word in there about educating people, only words in there about the interest of the Canadian state. The treaties came first, 1870 to 1877, and the whole process was meant to be mutually beneficial, or so said the special rhetoric of that time. Alexander Morris, who negotiated most of the treaties in his memoir of those times, called for a, quote, 
wise and parental government faithfully carrying out the provisions of our treaties, for in that way Canada will be enabled to feel that our country has done its duty to the Red Man. In fact, the reality was very different indeed, and it was so almost immediately. There was no happy period from treaties to some other state. For that, I turn to two of the best historians of the region, and I mean this seriously. Both are gone now, unfortunately, but I did get to meet and record some of the knowledge of the second man, Chief Richard Poorman of Quakatoos Reserve in Saskatchewan. The two, John Skibos, who had died on, before I was able to meet him, and Chief Poorman, described events as the government replaced Buffalo at the center of life. The herds were gone by 1879, there was nothing but famine. And the communities became trapped in treaty texts, frozen in time, interpreted unilaterally by Canada, and implemented in Canada's favor. It was interesting that the first treaty violation took place as early as 1879, two years after the treaties were signed. People were starving. When the new governor came out, Governor Dudney, he was approached by chiefs in uh, the Cypress Hills, and they said, please, uh, 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 fulfill the promise of uh, aid in hard times, which was a clause in Treaty Number 7, that the people would be fed, et cetera, and so forth. And the member of the RCMP, and I will say Northwest Mounted Police, say lots of kind things about the Mounted Police this morning, a member of the RCMP said to them, no, 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 just because you're hungry doesn't mean you're starving. And that was the end of that treaty promise. Skibos put his finger on what became quickly the post-treaty reality in the West. Well, they had more power. In other words, it came pretty rough towards the Indians. Even though they promised the Indians they would be in peace all the time after they signed treaty, but soon they established these Indian agencies and placed rough men, the Indian agents, then in there. The government made the Indian agent Indian Agency, Indian Affairs, and so on. Since that time, they didn't live up to the treaty. Chief Poorman's narrative is much the same, but he added the long-term economic consequences that would overtake nearly all the communities in the region. In the view of tribal negotiators, Poorman asserted, and he had, his great-great-grandfather had negotiated Treaty 4, the treaties were to be amended regularly to keep pace with changing needs. It was, in that sense, to be, quote unquote, a living treaty. Thus, for example, poor man told me, every four or five years they will count their people, how much they have, and based on that, they should get more land. But then, he said, the Indian agent took his course two years after the treaty. The Indian agent was put in place. They totally destroyed our treaty. There was no more treaty talks after that. And thus, we were unable to talk about what was needed for us to farm continuously. Nor, he continued, referring to the consequences of the remarkable population explosion after the Second World War, could they take into account that we were going to grow, and therefore the reserve and the treaty itself would be over time less and less useful to us. As instability grew in the region in the late 1870s, the products largely of government policy, short rations mainly, resistance taking up reserves, increasing settlement, the upsetting sojourn of Sitting Bull and his followers, and the approach of the railroad deep into Cree and Blackfoot territory, anxiety and the anticipation of violence grew. And Morris's policy was replaced by coercion. Anxiety was common on both sides, red and white. Poundmaker, for example, the famous chief poundmaker on New Year's Day, 1882, predicted, quote, next summer, or at the latest next fall, the railway will be close to us. The whites will fill the country, and they will dictate to us as they please. It is useless to dream that we can frighten them. That time has passed. It was in that context that McDonald moved to appoint Davin to assess education, residential education, for the Northwest Territories. Notice, I stress that, education, residential education for the Northwest Territories. Not just education generally, nor indeed residential schools across the country, but specifically for that region. Four years later, 
no, four years goes by from the submission of the report to 1883. And in those years, of course, Western conditions only got worse. More famine, more violence. In 1883, of course, he adopted residential schools. That became federal policy. The strategic purpose, as the primary purpose of the schools, despite the rhetoric of the white man's burden, is clear from a number of facts. First, I had thought that MacDonald had appointed Devon in 1879 as a thank you for church support in the 78 election, which he won by a landslide. But there's nothing in his private papers, I spent the winter reading them, to show that. So Johnny MacDonald was a good Scot like me, and the only way to read his private papers, and they're voluminous, is to drink single malt. I almost killed myself in February. <laughs> what a dreadful occasion. Rather, what they show, and here is my tribute to the Mounties, is it was the Northwest Mounted Police who lobbied him for the schools, beginning as early as 1878. In the opinion of Superintendent McLeod, the treaties were only a preface, he said, to achieving regional stability. They were, he said, very good as far as they go, but fall far short of what is required. And then he lists off what is required, a number of things. On that list was education. He wrote, I would recommend most strongly the establishment of residential schools at different points for both Indians and half-breeds. In dealing with this question, the half-breed element must not be overlooked. He is as much dependent on the supply of buffalo as the Indian, and he has claims which have already been brought under the consideration of the government. While this was about education, no doubt, the introduction or the request for schools, it was to socialize for the purpose of citizenship. It was to create the loyal subject. We've all seen, and if I had remembered to bring my pictures, I could have showed you the pictures of young residential school boys with their cadet caps on, right? Loyalty, service to the state, all the good stuff. But there was a sinister sub-theme that Davin himself had come across in Washington on his study tour in 1879. He got the, the, the mandate, he went to Washington, he talked to the American Indian Bureau, he had a, a look at an American uh, community which was starting a red school, or where a red school was being started, and then he came to Canada uh, and talk to the Catholic Church and to some of the more prominent Métis supporters of the Canadian government. In Washington, he had a meeting with Ezra Haight, Haight, excuse me, who was the head of the American Indian Affairs Department, who told him that he had directed Major Pratt, who was then about to leave on, uh, on, on a trip to recruit students as he was organizing the famous Carlisle Residential School. Pratt, who had served in the West as a cavalry officer, was going to see the Cheyenne and the Arapaho, people he said, who I know. He was pretty confident they'd give him his children. Hey, it said, no, you're not going there. You're going to, he said, quote unquote, the discontented branches of the Sioux Indians because their children would be hostages for the good behavior of their parents. We will take their children and we will hold them hostage. The Americans were dealing with the same problems we were, attempting to create a stable imperial area in the West. While this seems outlandish, that, that statement, a level of cynicism that reaches Machiavellian proportions, it is a sentiment that reappears in Canada. And I might want to note the connection with, with, uh, with, uh, with Davin. In 1883, Davin actually moved to Regina and started the, the leader, the paper that's still with us. I also want to note that he was a Presbyterian, although apparently not a very saintly man. He had, and why wouldn't you, an affair with the local milliner. They always in the 19th century seemed to find hat ladies to sleep with. And he apparently had, there must be a joke in there somewhere, he apparently had children with her and was seen as a rather dis disreputable fellow. Well, after all, he was Irish and a journalist, he couldn't get worse for that, and I guess he was an imbiber as well. In 1885, in Regina, just after the Rebe Real Rebellion, the church, the Presbyterian Church, petitioned MacDonald for a residential school, which was subsequently built just outside the city. In that petition, church officials included on a list of anticipated benefits that, quote, Indians would, would regard them, their children, as hostages given to the whites and would hesitate to commit any hostile acts that might endanger their children's well-being. 
This is not a one-off statement. A year later, the Indian Department uh, school inspector for the region, Inspector McRae, returned to the theme. It is unlikely that any tribe or tribes would give trouble of a serious nature to the government whose members had children completely under government control. And a final example, and there are a whole series of these examples, again from the same year, in Parliament, Tory MP W.O.W.E. O'Brien, excuse me, who had just visited Capel Residential School near Regina, argued for the opening of more schools in Parliament. I think they are the only hope we have of obtaining in the future anything like a grasp and a hold upon the Indian population. Therefore, he concluded, I hope the Indian Department will endeavor to encourage and develop these institutions. I've actually collected evidence which suggests, and this is evidence from, from survivors, but evidence of, of survivors in the 19th century who actually, evidence has actually made it into uh, federal documents, where people say, yeah, I didn't dare do anything because I feared what happened to my child in school. And there's a whole series of these, some of them quite tragic, uh, tragic examples. Mention of the Capel School takes us back to McDonald and his policies. In 1883, as the railroad was about to enter Blackfoot country, he finally acted, introducing in his budget presentation for the Department of the Interior three policies to tighten Canada's local grip. And location here is really important. First, he announced increased rations for tribes uh, in the Treaty 4 and Treaty 7 areas. It's better, he said in Parliament, to feed them than to fight them. Second, he increased funds and he increased the size of the Northwest Mounted Police, improving its military capabilities and placing additional constables to protect the line of the railroad as it ran through southern Alberta. And finally, he announced the opening of three industrial schools, the one at Battleford, the Quebec School uh, at Le Bret, which, by the way, was a loyalist Métis settlement, didn't like Louis Riel and his shenanigans, and a third to be announced at a later date. Again, the schools were placed, as you notice, in Treaty 4 and Treaty 7. Within a year, two more were approved, again in hot spots. One, identified by MacDonald in his budget speech, these were the, these were the Kootenai School, which was uh, uh, on the line of, uh, route, on the route, excuse me, proposed route for the CPR, that actually sent the Mounties in uh, to quell unrest in the area, even though that was quite illegal. The Mounties weren't to cross into British Columbia, but they did anyways. And Cooper Island, uh, which is a small island four kilometers off the coast of Vancouver Island, as MacDonald himself mentioned in Parliament in 1883 during that budget speech, that he feared the disruption of the couch and timber industry by the local bands. So they got a school as well. Also, and you may have noticed from uh, Chief Littlechild's slide, that his school was started in 1887, I believe it was. A whole bunch of them mushroom in the Treaty 4, Treaty 7 area in 85, 86, 87. There's more than you could damn well count. So many of them are opened up. While McDonald's policies did not avert the Real Rebellion, they certainly were not abandoned. Afterwards, indeed, coercion was ramped up as worries about uh, the peace, uh, peaceable conditions in the area continued. For example, the department, the Northwest Mount Apigi Police again, and some clerics, Father Lacombe, most vehemently had lobbied for a pass system from 1882 on. And even, even though, excuse me, all acknowledged that it was a violation of treaty promises. In 1885, MacDonald approved it, having been convinced that, quote, now the pass system could be generally introduced safely. Residential schools came in for similar treatment. Immediately after the rebellion, there was a reaffirmation of their importance, a reaffirmation brought on by continuing instability. There was, moreover, a realization that threats to public order were endemic to the colonizing process and therefore would not be limited to the Prairie West nor to this particular time in the development of the nation. Rather, such dangers, real or imagined, would persist as Canada over the decades became a disruptive presence in indigenous communities. One of the best examples was the Kootenai School, uh, uh, that uh, the crisis at the end of it was indeed uh, solved by forcing the band, yep, forcing the band, I'm giving the hurry up sign, I'll read as fast as I can, forcing the band actually to dig up 
its graveyard because the CPR said it was going to run the line right through that particular place. There's no better example of disruption. The coincidental appearance of residential schools in those areas was not simply an example of Canadian humanitarianism. Rather, they appeared lockstep, as it were, with the spread of settlement. Certainly, departmental correspondence at the highest level reflected this. McRae in 1900, all agreed as to its importance not only as an economical measure to be demanded for the welfare of the country and the Indians, but in order that crime may not spring up and peaceful conditions be disturbed as that element which is the forerunner and companion of civilization penetrates the country. Clifford Sifton, who was minister at that point, said, no, 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 residential schools aren't treaty promises. Not at all. Residential schools were policy and they were designed to get rid of dangerous barbarism throughout the country. Duncan Campbell Scott, one of your favorite people, excised that section of the Sifton Memorandum and repeated it over and over again in Miranda, Memorandum and correspondence with others about the schools. In Treaty 8, which of course was brought to us by the invasion of gold miners into that particular territory and anticipated violence, we have immediately a treaty and within that treaty the promise of residential schools. What people don't really realize is the promise of residential schools came with a promise that the schools would teach nothing that disturbed the religion of the people in the area, and that part of the promise, of course, was violated almost immediately by turning those schools over to the Catholics and the Protestants. There were moves to make the schools effective. That had been a problem right from the very beginning. Parents said, we're not doing that. We're not giving our children up. So they made in uh, the Northwest Territories, they immediately made uh, school uh, attendance compulsory. Uh, they uh, told the parents that when the children went to schools, they belonged to the crown, not to the parents any longer. They fined the parents if they tried to remove their schools. The Northwest Mounted Police surrounded the schools uh, at Battleford, for example, and refused to allow the parents to take their children out. The pass system was enforced. Parents were told that if they were leaving the reserve, they would only get a pass if they swore they were not going to the schools to remove their children. So the place got, to say the least, locked down. As Wilton said, there was a barbed wire fence and it was electrified. The once highly praised Mounties became pariahs. They came to your community to arrest the guilty and to take away the most innocent, the community's children. The RCMP claims it was not privy to the consequences of that, did not know of the abuse of children, but I have found evidence uh, that they turned a blind eye to abuse of children, to serious abuse of children. And if I could get into their files, and maybe someday I will, I'm sure I'll find more evidence that they collaborated with the physical and sexual abuse of children by refusing to act on it. What have I really told you? Not much that you didn't expect. The interests of the state come first. But there's a larger historical question that I'm trying to answer. And that question is why? What happened when the country became fully settled consolidated, and the federal government had control from sea to sea to sea. Is that the reason it turned its back on the schools, turned its back on the communities, refused to provide funds, refused to provide support, put no money into education, into community development, and into child welfare, and wouldn't pay them any more attention until the next resort panic came, the sort of resource panic we have today. I'm sorry for uh, uh, extending my time, I, I tend to wander both verbally and intellectually, right? I just sort of lose it. So thank you very much for listening as patiently as you, as you have.